So it's a great pleasure to have Professor Subrat Raju from International Center for Theoretical Sciences, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. Uh, uh, I, for this, like other participants, a lot of people don't uh, knows about Subrat's work, but like for general, I will uh, just introduce himself, uh, like what he, uh, his background is. He did his PhD from Harvard and uh, he was in Harish Chandra Research Institute for a long time. Then he shifted to ICTS as a professor and his area of expertise is quantum field theory and string theory. And he's going to talk about a physical protocol for near boundary observers to obtain bulk information in quantum gravity. And uh, 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 we will welcome you Subrat from Potsdam. This is basically 39th uh, QASTM seminar. And uh, it's a great pleasure to have in this forum. Thank you. And you can start from your end. OK, uh, so thank you very much, uh, Shantan, for that uh, introduction and for inviting me uh, to give this seminar. Uh, thank you also, all of you who've, who've joined. Uh, so uh, uh, just before I start, let me just acknowledge my collaborators. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to speak on uh, this last paper that we wrote with uh, Chandramoli and Olga. Uh, but uh, the work, uh, uh, this work was in continuation of some earlier work that I did in collaboration with Alok, Siddharth, and Pushkal, and then with, also with Shovik and Jan Willem and Kiriakos, and also some work I did on my own. Uh, so this is a useful set of references if you'd like to look at them later. Uh, so let me just start by giving you the big picture uh, that I'm going to try and speak about. So over the, the past uh, few years, uh, we've been, I think, developing uh, some uh, evidence uh, for a rather remarkable uh, property of uh, quantum gravity. Uh, and this remarkable property uh, is as follows. Uh, uh, we've been uh, developing some evidence that in quantum gravity, uh, if you have a geometry where there's some region R, uh, which is encompassed by its complement. So, you know, you look at the figure here. Uh, there's a region R and the complement R tilde completely surrounds R, uh, then uh, the claim is that all the information that's available in R is also available perhaps in a scrambled form uh, in the complement R tilde. So just to emphasize how surprising the property is, uh, let me just point out the contrast uh, with the local quantum field theory. Uh, so if you have a local quantum field theory and you have the same region R and R tilde, uh, you could place some object inside this region R, if you see my mouse here, uh, without the observer outside having any inkling that you had placed that object. Uh, so for instance, if there's some observer outside and I switched on the light bulb in this room, uh, there's no way this observer outside would know about it. Uh, you know, of course, if you waited for some time or enough time, signals from the light bulb might reach the observer, uh, but just on a single Cauchy slice, uh, there is no way this observer would know about whether this object is present here or not uh, in a local quantum field theory. Uh, the claim is that in gravity, uh, this is impossible. Uh, when you try and place an object inside this region R, uh, you're forced to also modify the wave function of the world outside R as a result of the constraints of gravity. And so the claim is that the observer outside can discern in gravity whether the object uh, is present uh, or whether it is not. Okay. Uh, so this uh, is so surprising in a sense uh, that, you know, it sounds like uh, th this kind of principle is so surprising and so much, you know, so against uh, the usual intuition that we have uh, from locality uh, that sometimes uh, people tend to think of this as, you know, some, some abstract or some, some subtlety about gravity, which is of uh, no real relevance uh, in actual physics. Uh, so the point of this talk, the main point I would like to make in this talk uh, is that this is not the case, uh, but this feature of gravity is something that's a very physical feature. And I'm going to uh, try and spend this talk, at least a large part of this talk, uh, trying to explain how this physical feature is realized in a completely controlled example uh, in global anti dissider space. More specifically, uh, what I'm going to do is, uh, you know, take global anti dissider space and then uh, consider some Cauchy slice, if you see my mouse, uh, some Cauchy slice that runs through global anti dissider space. And then we consider some set of observers who are confined to this brown or dark red annular region near the boundary of anti dissider space. And they have to make observations on that Cauchy slice itself. 
Uh, and I'm going to try and show you how, by using a very physical protocol, using physical operations, uh, these observers uh, in gravity uh, can obtain complete information about the state of the theory uh, near the center of ADS, including these regions uh, that look like they are inaccessible to them in the middle of ADS. Okay, so that's going to be uh, the main result that I'll try and establish in this talk. Uh, this result actually also has implications uh, for other settings, including for black holes. Uh, I, I won't uh, focus on that in this talk, but I will towards the end describe some of the implications of this result for black holes. Uh, and the main implication is uh, that this result suggests that information about the interior of a black hole, so if you have a black hole spacetime, there's some interior of the, of the spacetime of the black hole, uh, then the, the main implication of this result is that information about the interior is outside in this red region even before the black hole has evaporated. Okay, so that's again uh, perhaps a somewhat surprising claim, uh, but I'll try and make it more robust uh, as we go along. Uh, so those are going to be the main uh, results and the main physical points uh, that I'll try and emphasize in this talk. Okay? Uh, so that being said, uh, let me just try and give you uh, an outline of uh, how I'll go about this talk. Uh, so I already gave you the introduction. Uh, in the next section, I'll try and uh, you know, make the setting more precise. So I said I'll consider these observers uh, in global anti deciter space. Uh, so I'll try and make that more precise. I'll try and explain what the powers of the observer are and uh, what the observations they're allowed to make are uh, and what the states we are considering are. Uh, and then I'll give you some simple examples of how these observers uh, who live near the boundary of anti deciter space can obtain information about the center of ADS without actually physically visiting uh, the center. Uh, and then I'll uh, explain the more general protocol, which will explain how they can completely identify any low energy uh, state of quantum fields. Uh, and then uh, in the last part of my talk, I'll explain how, uh, even though most of my talk will be about low energy states, how one can extrapolate uh, these results uh, to the full theory. And this extrapolation uh, will then allow me to make some conclusions about black holes, which I'll do at the end. Okay, so let me start by, by describing the setting for the talk. Okay, so as I said, uh, we'll consider some theory of gravity uh, that's coupled to matter. Uh, and uh, this theory lives in some space time that's uh, asymptotically uh, global ADS. Uh, and I'm going to consider a set of low energy states uh, in this theory. And these low energy states that I will consider, uh, at least for the first part of my talk, uh, are very well described by excitations of quantum fields about the ADS vacuum. Uh, so the idea is that you know you have you have the gravity, you have matter, uh, you do effective field theory, you quantize the graviton, you quantize the matter fields, uh, and then you have some excitations about the global ADS vacuum, and these are the states uh, that we are going to consider in the first part of my talk. Okay, okay. so in fact uh, the relevant Hilbert space, uh, the Hilbert space uh, that one obtains by this kind of procedure, uh, is pretty well understood. Uh, you know, because we've studied ADS CFT uh, for, for very long, but even apart from that, it's a pretty simple exercise in effective field theory uh, to obtain the structure of the Hilbert space. Uh, and uh, let me just try and describe it uh, briefly. Okay. In global ADS, precisely because the ADS scale gives us an IR cutoff, uh, there is a unique vacuum, and that vacuum is separated from the lowest excited state uh, by some gap. Uh, the size of the gap depends on the spectrum of the theory. So if you have only massless particles, uh, this gap is given by the dimension of the boundary spacetime. Uh, but you know, it could be, it could be slightly lower. It's set by the unitarity bound. And then after that, you have other energy states. And these energy states are discrete. So at any given energy, you could have degeneracies. But if you look at the spectrum of energy levels, you have this discrete spectrum of energy levels, uh, which you can compute reliably uh, within the effective field theory. So that is the spectrum uh, that we are going to consider in the first part of this talk. Okay, uh, so I said uh, we have these observers uh, who live uh, near the boundary of ADS in, in such a space. Uh, and uh, I said that, you know, I wanted uh, these observers to live near the boundary of the space time in this brown region and try and obtain information about what kind of state there was. In, sorry for yeah. the interruption, because uh, like I want people should know this. So uh, somebody is asking that uniqueness of vacuum is an assumption in your theory? Sorry, this is in the chat box. I can't see. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, uniqueness of vacuum is not an assumption. It's something that will come out if you were to quantize fields. You know, uh, this is just the fact that if you quantize fields inside a box, uh, you'll get a vacuum, and then you'll get excitations on top of that, which are discretely spaced. 
Uh, so, you know, this is just, I'm just doing effective field theory about global anti-decidal space. There is no, uh, at this stage, there's no, I mean, there's no assumption beyond saying that effective field theory about global ADS is, uh, is, is valid. Okay? So I, I just have global ADS. I, I go to Biddle and Davies. I open Biddle and Davies. I learn how to quantize fields about the global anti-decidal space. And that gives me the spectrum you see there. Okay, that's, that's all I've done. There is another question. Yes, yeah. there are infinite backward degenerates. Uh, so can you repeat the question? The uh, in string, there are infinite backward degenerate. No, no, there are no infinite vacua here in global ADS. In, in, I mean, so I don't know if you're, if you're worried about moduli, you know, there might be some, some moduli you could change uh, and, and come up with different states, but those are all in different super selection sectors. You know, I fixed uh, the values of and the theory and I'm in a given so I'm just doing effective field theory once again about global ADS uh, if you did effective field theory and you added string theoretic excitations as effective fields there would be some other massive excitations that would appear at the string scale uh, but they wouldn't change the uniqueness of the vacuum okay. so this is uh, once again to emphasize uh, just uh, completely straightforward doing effective field theory in global anti decider space and there's no question of having an infinite degenerate vacuum so he's saying that so this is an infrared field infrared theory uh, I don't know what that means. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, sorry, I can't see the chat actually. I should uh, see, uh, should I, I don't want to stop sharing. Yeah, uh, yeah. maybe the, if the person who's asking the questions can unmute and ask, or maybe that's different. Yeah, yeah, that would be better because I have to speak a lot. You should ask the question directly, huh? Okay, uh, this is not an infrared theory. There's no, I mean, the, I, I, okay, it's a low energy sector of, of the theory. So there's some, there's some theory in global anti decider space, you know, there's some theory of quantum gravity. And we are going to consider the low energy sector the theory. That's what we do. Okay. Okay. You just yeah. Uh, so so as I said, uh, you know, we have observers. Uh, as I said, uh, we have observers who are going to explore this this theory, and are going to explore the the details of a state in this theory, which is a state of low energy excitations. Uh, but these these observers, uh, as I said, I want I want them to live in this annular region. But in fact, it's technically more convenient to think of the observers as living right next to the boundary. Uh, but confined to making observations in a time band that runs between zero uh, to epsilon uh, that you see here. Okay? So the time band runs between zero to epsilon and that's uh, where the observers are allowed to make observations. And within the, the approximation where I'm working, I'm just working with low energy uh, quantum field theory, this time band has the same set of operators as this annular region. So the annular region is more useful to get physical intuition. Uh, but in fact, if you open our paper, you'll see that everything we actually concretely do uh, is within uh, this time band. And the relation between the, the size of this annular region, if this annular region runs from R0 to infinity, this time band runs from zero to epsilon, the relation between the size of this annular region and the thickness of the time band is given by this, uh, which is just that R0 is equal to cot epsilon. By two. Okay? Uh, so I'm going to switch sometimes between this language of the time band and the annular region, and I hope it doesn't cause confusion. As you can see, you know, these things are just exactly the same because you draw the, the causal wedge of this time band and you will get exactly this annular region. Okay, so now what is it uh, that my observers are allowed to do? So, you know, we have some observers who live near, near the boundary of ADS and, and re remember, you know, we, we want to work uh, in this first part of the talk within effective field theory. Uh, so what are these observers allowed to do? Well, uh, they need to make some observations and some manipulations of the state to get information. Uh, so if you don't give them any powers, you can't ask them any questions. Uh, so the, the first power we're going to give them is the power to act with local unitaries, simple local unitaries from this time band or from this annular region. So for instance, uh, you know, if you were to take, uh, if you had some massive uh, scalar field in the bulk and you take the boundary value of that scalar field and I call that O of T omega, that's just the boundary value of the field, then I can integrate that over zero to epsilon. I can smear it with some function F, uh, both in time and on the sphere. And I put that inside a unitary and that gives me some allowed local unitary. Uh, you know, if you have, uh, since we'll consider not just single particle states, but multi-particle states, uh, you can also put in a double trace operator here or a triple trace operator here. But we are not going to consider in this first part very complicated unitaries. Uh, so these are unitaries that are well understood and can be analyzed with an effective field theory. So what such a unitary does is it creates a small excitation in this annular region. So if you were to take the state of global ADS, the vacuum, and act on it with some unitary, it might create this excitation. Uh, which you see is this green ball here. Uh, so, so far, uh, this is the same thing they could do in gravity or they could do in quantum field theory. And this is a very reasonable allowed manipulation that these observers are allowed to make. 
But now there is something they can do in gravity that they cannot do in a local quantum field theory. Uh, and this is a significant point. Uh, we will also allow the observers uh, to measure the energy of the state. And the energy of the state is given in a theory of gravity just by Gauss's law. So this is just by the Gauss law, uh, by taking the subleading fall off of the metric and by integrating it about uh, the entire boundary sphere. And because these observers live near the boundary, uh, in this brown region, this operator H is an operator from the brown region uh, that we will allow these observers to measure. So once again, I emphasize that this is a very physical thing. This is in fact how we measure the, the mass of astrophysical objects when we want to measure the mass of the sun. We don't actually go into the sun and try and determine the energy of the excitations. Uh, we just look at how the metric falls off and that gives us the mass of the sun. We're going to use the same. But be an important difference between the way we measure the mass of the sun and what these observers can do. And that's why this talk is a talk about quantum gravity. And the important difference is as follows. Uh, you see, we are going to allow these observers not just to measure the expectation value of the energy in the state, but to treat this energy as a quantum mechanical observable. Okay? So it's important that we have also quantized the graviton. Okay? So everything I'm going to say, even in this first part, uh, is not something that will hold in classical gravity. It's something that will hold in, in quantum gravity to the extent that we have quantized the graviton. And so I'm going to demand that these observers can apply the standard rules of quantum mechanics uh, to this Hamiltonian. So this Hamiltonian has a spectral decomposition like any other Hermitian operator in theory. Uh, and the spectral decomposition is just E in times, you know, the projector onto various energy levels. And in particular, I'm going to demand that the Born rule holds uh, when I measure this Hamiltonian. So if these observers are in some state G, uh, this notation G is going to be for, you know, any, uh, is, I'm going to use it always for the state that the observers are in. Uh, if the observers are in some state G, and they, they measure uh, this Hamiltonian, uh, then in quantum mechanics, we know that there is no fixed given answer they can get. There's a probability of getting different answers. And in particular, I'm going to demand that the probability of getting the answer E is just given by the expectation of the projector onto E in the state G. Uh, there is also a probability that in the state G, if they measure the Hamiltonian, they might get the answer zero. And that's a special projector, which will be important, which, which is the projector onto the vacuum. And that just tells me the probability that if they measure this Hamiltonian edge, uh, that they could get zero. Okay? So this is a difference from the way we usually talk about measuring energy using gravity in that it's not a classical measurement, but rather I'm going to apply the usual rules of quantum mechanics to this observable edge. Okay. okay, I want to emphasize that so far everything I've done uh, is, is the same thing that I teach in my, in my quantum mechanics course, okay, which I, for which I use this very nice textbook. Uh, but if you open any textbook, uh, this is the framework you will find uh, for understanding you know, basic questions about quantum information. And the basic question is that the observers have access to some subsystem. In this case, the subsystem in, 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 you know, that we think we are we're dealing with is some annular region near the boundary. And the observers are allowed to act with simple unitaries on that subsystem. And they're allowed to make simple projective measurements. Okay? It's of course important that the observers have access to identically prepared systems. Uh, because in quantum mechanics, if you don't have access to identically prepared systems, you can basically do very little uh, because quantum mechanics is a probabilistic theory. So, you know, we have to, to get details about a system or get information about a system. It's important that one is able to measure probability distributions. And we are going to allow these observers access to identically prepared systems so they can measure the probabilities I described in my previous slide. And once again, to emphasize, uh, this is uh, not a... a sorry. Uh, Sorry, there was a question again which went away. Uh, this is, this is, uh, sorry, Shantan, I have to uh, stop the, the talk to go to the chat. So if there's a question, maybe uh, can you read it out? Hi, hi Shantan. Uh, can you able to hear me now? Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, also, I, I just want to request if people have a question, if they type, if they speak to me, that's much better. If they type it in the chat, it, it appears and then it vanishes. So actually, I, I, I have to yeah, stop I have sharing. Also the same, actually. So it's written that I am very sorry, but I don't know how we are filtering super selection uh, sectors, probably. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, how are we filtering super selection sectors? So I don't know what that means. Uh, I don't know which super selection sector is being discussed here. Uh, uh, hello, sir. I'm Shreyansh. Uh, 
uh, sir i wanted to uh, i am bit worried about if the host uh, allows me to be the participant in the talk uh, uh, you are able to hear me yeah one second i am so i am too confused about what's happening here uh, yeah yeah go on please yeah okay so uh, i am just worried about uh, if we are uh, how we are filtering the super selection sector what super selection sector uh, meaning about, yeah. there are infinitely uh, there are infinitely degenerate vacua in our theory so you said that you are co considering some part of the super selection sector in our uh, no, no. Uh, in our sector there, so, there are no infinitely degenerate vacua here we we are in a, we are just doing effective field theory about global anti deciduous space there's a unique vacuum uh, and and the it's just it's just a so uh, yeah uh so how can we justify this assumption this is not i this is just doing effective field theory about global ads okay. you take a scalar field and we quantize it about global ads so take uh, quantize gravity about global ads you will find there's a vacuum and there are excitations which are gapped i don't know if you're worried about you know uh, there might be other uh, expectation values of some master skills you might be able to, like you know for for instance you know you could change like other you could change modular you might be able to change the string coupling or something but we're not doing that we're just you know we're, we're not changing the string coupling or changing something like that we're just saying you know there is a theory in global ads and you quantize fields perturbatively about that that you know uh, that vacuum and that will give you a unique vacuum and and gap states which is unlike the system for instance in flat space which we'll come to later but there is really a physical degeneracy in the vacuum you know there are lots of vacuum uh, and we need to be careful about how to distribute So I hope that satisfies uh, the question. I'll, I'll go on. Uh, so just to say, uh, you know, uh, this uh, the summary of what I said so far is that uh, the observers can act with uh, simple unitaries and can make uh, simple uh, projective uh, measurements. Uh, and uh, there is nothing unusual uh, that is happening here. This is the textbook framework uh, for quantum information questions, uh, and that's what we've set up for these observers so far. Okay, so now uh, this being said, uh, we're going to start by giving the observers, asking the observers some simple questions and seeing how they can use gravitational effects uh, to answer some simple questions about ADS. Okay, so uh, these simple questions are going to be, uh, you know, are, are just going to be some yes or no questions we'll ask the observers about the state in global ADS. Uh, but uh, let me emphasize that even, even though these questions might sound very simple, uh, these tasks that we're going to give the observers in this in this section are already going to be impossible in a local quantum field theory as i'll emphasize and they will already capture the essential physics of the more general protocol uh, that i'm going to describe in the next section so i will come to a more general protocol uh, but i'm just going to give you some simple examples and I, I i would like you know i'd like to encourage you to to pay attention here because they already capture the essential physics with a minimum of technicality okay so here is the first question we, are, we can ask the observers. Okay? Uh, the question is as follows. So I said, you know, we have some observers, they're confined to this brown annular time band and the system is in some state G. Okay? Now we will ask the observers to determine if the state G is the same as the global vacuum or if it's some different state. So, you know, the question is, you know, is there some, you know, is, is the state is the state G that the observers are living in, is it really the same as, as global anti deciduous space, the vacuum everywhere? Or is there some excitation that lives somewhere in the middle of anti deciduous space? Okay. So it's a perfectly well-defined question. As I said, we have a Hilbert space and we're asking the observers to determine whether the state is the same as the vacuum or not. Okay. Let me emphasize that in a local quantum field theory, this task is impossible. Okay. And that's because if you confine the observers to this Cauchy slice, this single Cauchy slice, and you ask them to make observations in this annular region, there is no way they can distinguish the vacuum of the theory from this other state where you have acted on the vacuum with a bulk unitary operator localized near the middle of PDS. And the reason is that this bulk unitary operator commutes with every observable in a local quantum field theory that lives on this annular region. And so it doesn't change any probability that somebody can measure in a local quantum field theory. Once again, I emphasize that if you were to allow the observers to go up to arbitrary time, so go up to light crossing time of ADS, then they would be able to determine, of course, in the local quantum field theory, whether the excitation existed or not. But we are not doing that. We are saying 
on the same Cauchy slice, make a measurement in this annular region and determine if this blue excitation exists or not in the middle of anterior sitter space. And it's quite clear that this is something which is completely impossible in a local quantum field theory. It's also completely impossible in a non-gravitational gauge theory because this blue excitation could be made up of, you know, acting with e to the i trace of f squared uh, near the middle of ADS. And that would be, that's something again that would com commute completely with every observation you could make in this ground triangle. Okay, so now how do the observers uh, solve this problem in gravity? In gravity, the answer is very simple. And the way they obtain success in gravity is they just measure the Hamiltonian. And as I said, when they measure the Hamiltonian, they can get various possible answers. And, you know, by repeating this measurement on the many identically prepared systems they have, uh, they can in particular determine the probability that they're going to get zero. That probability is just determined by, you know, looking at the relative frequency after you've done a large number of measurements. And this probability by the Born rule is directly given by more g in the old mod. If this overlap is one, it tells you that g is the same as the vacuum. If this overlap is not one, it tells you that g is not the vacuum. Okay? So you have a very simple protocol that allows the observers to determine whether or not this excitation exists in the middle of ADS or whether it does not exist. Okay? So it's very simple. And uh, you know it's the first thing that the observers can do uh, just by measuring the Hamiltonian. And as I said, it's important that they don't just measure, you know, uh, they, 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 they are able to measure probabilities when they measure the Hamiltonian. And by doing this, they immediately determine the overlap of G and zero mod squared. Okay. okay. I forgot. Yes. Hi, Gautam. Yeah. Um, hi, hi, Gautam. Yeah, hi, hi. I think I have asked you before uh, this thing also, but um, yes. let me ask you again. Uh, perhaps if I explain, but uh, please do explain again. So the yes. suppose this was uh, just gauge theory, yeah. Uh, yes. Let's say uh, QVD, and uh, yes. and the stuff that's sitting at the center is a charged particle. Yes. And uh, instead of measuring the um, you know uh, Hamiltonian, uh, which is like the ADM mass, you measure the charge. Yes. Okay. Where there also, I mean, uh, you know, so there's a flux. There's a limited yes. amount of information about that uh, blob that will sit in the middle, but there is yeah. some information nevertheless if there is a the localized blob that sits in the middle. Yeah, it, it, it's the charge. But, but you know, in this case, we were asking a different question. We were asking the observers, uh, so just to say, uh, let me give the task. We are asking the observers to determine if the state is a vacuum or not. So if you're in QED, you could take some Wilson loop and act, you know, this blue ball could be made of some Wilson loop that's confined to this region where you see my mouse. And this Wilson yeah. loop completely commutes with every observation these, these uh, observers near the boundary can make. So even though the state is now different, uh, there, it, you know, there is nothing the observers can do to determine if the state is a vacuum or not. You're right, the observers can tell the total charge, uh, if, you know, if there's some total charge inside or not. Uh, but that's very far from saying if the state is a vacuum or not. And that's the reason is that there's an infinite number of states which have total charge zero. Mm. So they, uh, there's an infinite number of sta states at every value of the charge. So all the observers can say is that you're in a certain charge sector and, and nothing more. In this case, we are saying the observers can actually identify whether the state is this particular vacuum or if it is something else. Uh, so there's a very important difference, uh, which is that, you know, in one case, you, you, you're, able to, you're able to restrict only to an infinite sector of states, all of which have the same charge. And you're not able to determine whether there's really an excitation or not. You're only able to tell the total charge. Uh, but in this case, you're really able to rule out the possibility of having any excitation anywhere in the middle of it. Uh, so, if the if the uh, if the particle that sit in the middle uh, yes. has a mass, then of yes. course yes. you can say that this state is different from the vacuum. Yes. But yes. you cannot say what that state is. That's no, you. I will. I will be able to say also what the state is. At this point, I'm only giving a very simple task. Uh, as we go along, I'll, I'll also explain exactly what the oh, state is. No, no, sorry. So what I meant is that in QVD, you can only say that. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. It has uh, a total charge. Say, yeah, yeah. So you are measuring much more than the ADM mass. That, that's, that's what. It is. So in, in, in no no in, in here I'm going to I'm only measuring the ADM mass. I'm not doing anything else. You were measuring the ADM mass. Yes, and I will I will later also tell you how. At this point, I, I'm only you see the difference between gravity and and gas theories is there's no notion of a negative mass. So because of the positivity of the Hamiltonian, if you put an excitation, there's no way to hide the excitation. Whereas in, in, in QED, I could put a positive and a negative charge and I could make it completely invisible to the charge near the boundary. Ah. And there's an infinite number of configurations I can have with positive and negative charge. 
But in gravity, I can't do that. So that's why in gravity already I'm able to tell if there's a vacuum. You're right. You might have thought, so I'll, I'll come to your question in a minute. But at this point, I just want to make a very simple statement, which is if you were to ask me this very simple question, uh, then, you know, I could already answer it in gravity, which I would not be able to do in any other theory, including theory. Yeah. Is that okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So uh, this is a good, good. Uh, actually, thank you very much for that question, because you see, I, 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 I kind of uh, anticipated that question. Because you know, you you might have said as as kind of as kind of Gautam said, you know, this is a very special case, uh, and, and I'm I'm kind of cheating because you know the vacuum in, in gravity is identified by a conserved charge. It's identified by a charge which is zero, and there is only one state which has charge zero, and that's the vacuum. Okay? So you might have said, okay, you know, uh, well done. Uh, you can you have identified the state which is identified by a conserved charge, but but I'm sure you can't do too much more. You know, that if you the moment you start going to other excited states. Uh, there'll be many states which have the same energy and then you won't be able to do much. Uh, so that's a very natural question. And so now we're going to give you emphasized in the answer to the question. Uh, it's important that already the observers have done something that they couldn't have done in local QFT. Now we'll show how they can do even more. Okay. So now here's the harder task we're going to give them. The harder task is as follows. So let's say the observers are in a state D, okay, and, and uh, I, there's only one simplification I'm going to make. I'll tell you later how to get rid of that. Let's assume this D is actually orthogonal to the vacuum. So, you know, the observers can check this by measuring the energy and determining there's no probability for getting zero. There are many states which are orthogonal to the vacuum. So let's say the observers happen to be in a state G and G is orthogonal to the vacuum. Now let X be some simple Hermitian operator from this time band zero to epsilon or equivalently this annular region. And consider the state, you know, the state which is ket x, which is just obtained by the mathematical application of the operator x uh, to the vacuum. Now, as I'll emphasize later, it's true, you know, if you if you act with Hermitian operators in arbitrary ways, you can create all kinds of excitations. In fact, you can create by acting with a Hermitian operator. So this Hermitian operator is not necessarily a unitary operator, it's just a Hermitian operator. And by doing these kinds of operations, you can create some states that might, for instance, have an excitation. Uh, somewhere in the middle of ADS. So now we ask the observers to determine if the state of the system, the global state G that they live in, is the same as the state ket x or not. So this is yet another yes no question. And so for instance, you know, they want to distinguish between the state which is ket x or the state which is a unitary acting on ket x. So you know you could have the state, maybe x corresponds to a state which has this red ball in the middle. And, uh, you know, there's a unitary acting on X, which corresponds to a state which has a blue ball. It could even be, in fact, that these states have the same expectation value for the energy, uh, which is what we asked, which is what Gautam was asking previously. So maybe, you know, these two states, red and blue, have the same uh, value for the energy. And we want to determine if it's the red one or if it's the blue one. Okay? So that's the question we are now giving the observers. Okay. Okay. So... Once again, uh, this task is completely hopeless in a local quantum field theory. Uh, we can't even tell in local quantum field theory you know, whether the ball is there or not. But in fact, uh, the observers can complete this task in gravity, but through a two-stage process. Two-stage process is as follows. Remember, I said that they're allowed to act with these unitary operators. So we will allow the, the observers to act with a unitary operator, e to the i j x. So x was a simple Hermitian operator near the boundary. And I'll allow them to act with e to the i j x, but in the vicinity of j equal to zero. So this is a manipulation that we said in the beginning was allowed for the observers to make. They could do unitary manipulations from their little region. And this manipulation takes the state g to unitary times in g. Uh, and we are only going to work perturbatively in this parameter j. Uh, so I've expanded out this unitary uh, to first two orders in j. So it's 1 plus i j x minus j squared x squared uh, acting on the state g. After I make this manipulation, subsequent to this manipulation, I'm going to measure the energy and I'm going to determine, you know, the various probabilities to second order in J. In particular, I'm going to ask if I first make this manipulation and then measure the energy, what is the probability of getting zero? Let me remind you that the probability of getting zero before I made the manipulation was zero. Okay, that was something I put in as a simplifying assumption. But after I make the manipulation, the probability of getting zero is just given by the Born rule, is given by taking this G acting with U dagger and determining the, the probability of P zero in this modified state. You can compute what this probability is. 
I've written down what the expression is just by expanding this unitary uh, to both sides uh, to second order in J. So on one side you have minus ijx, on the other side you have plus ijx, and then there are j cube terms that are thrown away because we don't want them. But now remember that this p0 that lives in the middle is just bra0 ket0. It's a projector onto the vacuum. And remember also that the original state g had no overlap with the vacuum. And that tells you that this term 1 does not contribute. Because if you take this term 1, you see that g hits the 1, which hits this uh, ket0. And this ket0, uh, this is just 0 because 0 g is 0. On the other side as well, this 1 does not contribute because you have a ket g. And it comes and hits this bra 0. And that's also 0. So the only term that contributes, the leading term, is this jx term. And so if you look at this probability to second order in j, you will find that the term you will get will look like g into j into x acting on ket 0. And then once more, you know, bra 0 into x and g. So if you do that, find me the probability of getting 0 to second order in j is directly given by the overlap of g and x. So this very simple manipulation has told you the overlap of g and x and the mod squared of that overlap. Okay? So this tells you that the observers are successfully able to complete this task of telling you whether the global state was the state x or if it was some other state. Okay. Uh, so, that, so this is the mo uh, motivation to take up to the j squared term? Yes. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, we need to keep up to j squared terms to see this. That, that, this is actually the leading term. There is no order j term and yeah. no order 1 term. Yeah. The, the leading term is a j squared term. Okay. Okay. And, and the observers can, can measure this term. This is a direct physical observable because they just need to make this unitary manipulation for different values of j and determine, you know, then measure the energy. So it's a completely physical process. You make the manipulation, you measure the energy, and then look at the, the probability of getting zero after you do that. And you determine what the j squared term in that probability is. And you see that when you do this, you directly obtain the overlap of G with X. So the conclusion is that using gravitational effects, if the observers are placed in a state G, which has no overlap with the vacuum, then they can determine immediately what the overlap of G with the state X is. And here, I remind you that X, which was uh, ket X, I was using the notation, was just the application of any Hermitian, near boundary Hermitian operator on the vacuum. This is actually going to be a key physical step in my more general protocol because this set of states, which are x, the, ac the action of x on zero, as I'll describe later, already form a basis uh, for the full Hilbert space. Uh, so this is actually a key step in the protocol. Uh, so are there any questions at this point? I can stop for questions and then I'll go on to the next part of the talk. So I would suggest all the participants by this point, please ask the questions, whatever you have. If you have any questions, please ask to the speaker. Uh, can I ask you a question? Please, please. Yes, sure. uh, so where did you use uh, the X is a near boundary formation operator? Yeah, I used it in the fact that the operate, the observers were allowed to act with a unitary, which was e to the i j X. You see the powers we gave the observer were that they were allowed to act with local unitaries. Local unitaries. If the observers are just allowed to act with arbitrary unitaries, then of course, you know, they can do anything they want. So it was important that the observers allowed to act with local unitaries and e to the i j x is a local unitary because x is a near boundary operator. And so e to the i j x is a local unitary near the boundary. That's where you Okay, okay. Thanks. Uh, hi, Shuvrat. Can I ask a question? Yes, yeah, sure, yeah. So uh, where did you use actually that uh, you're working in gravity and gravity special in this argument in this way? It's the fact that, that when I measure the energy, I could measure the energy. It's always, you know, gravity always appears every time when I measure the energy. So yeah, the observers cannot even measure the energy from near the boundary in any other theory except for in gravity. So the fact that I use gravity in, in the second step. So the first step, they can always do in any quantum field theory. But the second step, which is where they measure the energy from near the boundary, and then they obtain, they look at the probability of getting zero. That is only something they can do in the theory of gravity. In a local quantum field theory, they would have to explore the whole Cauchy slice and determine the bulk Hamiltonian, and only then they could measure the energy. So the only yeah. step, so the, the important part of gravity was the second step. You measure the energy from the other part. Did that answer the question? Yeah, yes, thanks. Okay. Thank any other questions? Uh, hi, Super. I have a naive question. Maybe I missed something. So can you go back to the last slide, please, uh, where you have this red and blue dots? 
yeah. yeah. Uh, so in this case, uh, primarily, uh, you assume that the overlap between G and uh, the vacuum is zero. Uh, yeah. That's so the now, simplification. Yeah. So yeah. I, yeah. I, I'll, yeah. Yeah, so when we uh, consider x as an operator uh, acting on zero, do we consider the x uh, state? Isn't it uh, an eigenvalue of uh, or eigenstate of zero, or are we considering some complicated states? I, uh, I mean, you know? uh, I mean, uh, since g and zero have zero overlap, so shouldn't yes. g and x also have some kind of zero overlap? No, no. I mean, uh, you know, maybe uh, G is G, you see, uh, let, let's say the expectation value of X was zero. Okay. Yeah. So m maybe G is X. Okay. But all I'm saying when I say G zero is zero is that the expectation value of X is zero. Right? Because if you look at the overlap of X with zero, I'll get, I'll get, you know, expectation value of X of the operator X. You see, uh, the overlap of get X with zero is just the Operator. I take greater x, which has which has you know zero expectation value. I'll find a state which has zero overlap with the vacuum. So G could be x, and you know it could have it could have zero overlap with the vacuum, but it could have overlap one with state x. Okay. So x is any general operator, and what we are trying to see here is whether G and x are same or not. That's right. Whether ket x is the same as G or not. Okay. I think one more question, Anuda, please yeah. unmute yourself and ask. Hello. I don't know. Yeah, I can hear you. Go on, please. Yeah. So maybe I can read that. It's written, are non-local effects evident in semi-classical gravity? Well, uh, you know, we can draw whatever conclusion we like at this. Uh, I'd like to postpone that question. Uh, I mean, they are, I think, but, you know, non-local and so on are all terms which can cause confusion. At this point, I'm just, uh, you know, just doing uh, physical things which are completely within semi-classical effective field theory in that. Okay, Subrat, you can proceed then. Fine. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now let me go on to the more general protocol. Okay, so far I was asking the observers yes, no questions, right? Is the state the vacuum? Is the state X or not? Okay. But of course, I, as I said, uh, the, 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 the main result is going to be the observers can actually completely determine the state. So now we'll give the observers a harder task, which is as follows. We just put them in some state G and we say, identify G. Okay? So I'm not asking you if the G is a vacuum or G is some state X. I'm just saying you're in some state, which is a state of low energy quantum fields. You know, maybe it has this red, blue, green ball. Maybe it has all kinds of excitations. Now you have to tell us uh, what uh, the state G is. Okay, so that's the question. The hard, the, the hard task that the observers are doing. Let's just make this a little more precise to avoid confusion later. Uh, the state G is going to be a low energy state. That's important because I want to work in effective field theory. What I mean by low energy is that there's some ultraviolet cutoff, which I call lambda. And if you project G onto all states, all energy levels below lambda, that gives you almost all of G. It's important that G may have some high energy tails. In fact, when you act with localized unitaries, you generally do generate small high energy tails. But I want this high energy tails to be small, so I want the projection of G with the low energy Hilbert space to be large. Okay. Uh, second, uh, I, you know, the observers are not asked to find G exactly, but there's some error margin that they have. And uh, the error margin is part of the task specification. So, you know, uh, we say you need to find some state G, some G estimated state, which has almost one overlap, which has overlap one minus delta with the true state G. If that is the case, we are always happy in quantum mechanics. You know, in quantum mechanics, we are never bothered with finding the state exactly because there are probabilities, but rather we are interested in finding the state. We are interested in finding a close enough state because then the bond rule tells us that all probabilities are almost the same in this close enough state as they are in the original state. Okay? So we are going to give the observers some a small error margin. The error margin, of course, is much smaller than one. So, you know, they need to determine the state accurately but it's going to be much larger than one over n. So in particular, there is some one, by one over n, I mean here, the ratio of the Planck scale to the ADS scale, which I'm going to take to be a large number. And this error margin is much larger than one over n. So I'm not going to ask them to determine the state to an accuracy one over n, but to an accuracy which is much better than one. So that's the, the precise task that the observers are given. So they're given a low energy quantum state and they're asked to determine it to a good accuracy. Okay. 
So now um, let me just describe how this goes. I'm going to say that some things that might be a little technical. So let me just try and tell you how I'm going to, how this protocol will, will go. Uh, so the first point I'll try and make is that the states which are obtained by acting with low energy Hermitian operators near the boundary on the vacuum already form a basis for the low energy Hilbert space. Okay? Uh, these are the states we already considered previously. Second, uh, using an extension of the previous protocol, we can get the overlap of G with X. I want to point out that previously I got the mod squared of this overlap, uh, but what I need to explain now is how to get also the phase of this overlap. And once I do that, because I have a basis, if I can do this systematically for every X, for every element of the basis, uh, that allows me to completely determine the state G. So if I know the overlap of G with every element of a basis, I completely know G. And that's going to be how I'll proceed. So I'm going to explain these two points in turn. Let me start by explaining point one. Okay. So I'm going to explain point one rather than explain it in quantum field theory. I'm going to take a simple qubit example to explain point one because I think it already brings out the essential part of this and it also removes some of the mystery of this result. Okay. Uh, so let's consider the famous EPR pair uh, where we have some state. Uh, this is forget about quantum. Have two, and we have this state which is uh, 0, 0 plus 1, 1. So it's an entangled state. Uh, and you know, the coefficients could be 1 over root 2, but we can take them to be a and b as long as both a and b are non zero. Okay. Then the main point to realize okay, is that the Hermitian operators on the first qubit already generate a basis for the full Hilbert space of these two qubits. Okay. So the full Hilbert space of these two qubits is four dimensional, and you can generate a basis for this Hilbert space in this way. So let's say you act with one plus sigma z. The reason I have a superscript one is to emphasize that this poly operator acts only on the first spin, not on the second spin. You see, if you do this, you project onto the first spin being zero. And so this just, you know, manage this equation is just true. Similarly, one by two b into one minus sigma z just gives you one. Okay? So just acting on the state side with this operator gives you one. You act with sigma x, it gives you one linear combination of one zero plus zero one. You act with sigma y, it gives you the other linear combination of 1, 0, minus 0, 1. These four vectors are manifestly linearly independent and they manifestly form a basis for the Hilbert space. Now let me pause here. Okay? Uh, you see, I said if you act with Hermitian operators in the first qubit, you can manipulate the state in all these ways. But I want to emphasize that this mathematical fact, this is a mathematical fact, it's manifestly true, you can see in your screens. But this mathematical fact does not violate locality. You see, I could have taken these entangled pairs and taken this part and kept it with me on Earth and taken the other part and sent it off to Mars. And of course, you know, if I could do some of these operations, I would change the, the, the probability distribution for the observer on Mars. But the point is, and something we forget, is that these, you know, these are all mathematical equations, but they don't really correspond to physical operations. Physically, one can only act with a unitary operator. One is not allowed to act with Hermitian operators in the state. If you could act with Hermitian operators in the state, you could do all these wonderful things like I do here, which also change the probability distribution for the second qubit. But physical operations are only unitary operations. And so while this is a mathematical fact, I want to point out that this fact that you can generate a basis is not a violation of locality at all. And that's why it's going to be true also in a quantum field theory. When I come to that, without there being any violation of locality, it's just a manifestation of entanglement. And I also want to say, you know, sometimes there's a problem with language because we say act with the Hermitian operator on the state. Uh, that doesn't really correspond to a physical action. It just corresponds to mathematically applying the Hermitian operator to the state. Okay. So the point is that in any quantum field theory, because the vacuum itself is entangled, because the vacuum has entanglement between this brown region and this yellow region, uh, you can play the same trick. Okay? Except here you're playing the trick in an infinite dimensional space. And the same argument as something you can prove formally uh, tells you that a basis for all states can be generated by applying Hermitian operators in this brown region uh, from the annulus uh, to the vacuum. Okay. Uh, and as I said, this is something you can prove formally, but I'm going to describe how you can even check it explicitly in a very simple way. And once again, to emphasize this doesn't require gravity or any loss of locality. It's just a very simple statement that's true in any quantum field theory. In particular, we can check it explicitly in the following way. Okay? Uh, the check is as follows. You see, think of single particle states. So the single particle states, say you have some, some, some propagating field in the bulk, uh, some uh, scalar field phi, and there's a boundary value O. Uh, the scalar field phi corresponds to a conformal representation in ADS. It has some primary operators, and it has descendants of that. 
And let's say we wanted to generate one such state, NL, that lived in this representation by just acting with operators from this time back. Uh, so you can do this explicitly by just getting some set of trial states by taking this operator O and smearing it with some function that vanishes outside zero to epsilon. This W is just some function that vanishes smoothly at zero to epsilon. And then also smearing it with some angular momentum mode because you're not restricted to, on the sphere, you can go all around the sphere. And this gives you some set of trial states which are labeled by this, this M, which is this E to the IMT you put in here. And then you could try and find these coefficients Cm so as to minimize the distance between NL and this trial state that you developed. Uh, as I said, there's a formal proof, which I won't go into, but it's very easy. It's in a paper, uh, which will tell you that this, uh, you know, if you start increasing the number of states you have in the sum, uh, this uh, minimum will converge to zero, but you can just do this numerically. There's a very simple Mathematica script, which is also part of our paper. You can just open it and you can see numerically, uh, this graph is not as clear as I would have liked it to be, but you can see what happens as you increase the number of states you include in the sum. This is M max. And by the time you are 30 states, already you have an excellent approximation to whatever state you want to develop. So this is an explicit demonstration of the fact that you can take states in a time It's an explicit numerical demonstration. And as I said, it's something you can prove formally as well. And to emphasize, this is true in any quantum field theory. It's not a violation of locality. It's not, you know, it's not even something very surprising uh, if you think about it for more than a few minutes. Okay. okay. Uh, once more, once you've got single particle states, as I showed previously, uh, we can approximate all low energy states just by multi-particle in the state. And that's because, you know, the, the low energy Fox space, the low energy Hilbert space that we have has the structure of a Fox space because it's obtained from effective field theory. You did effective field theory, and then you looked at multi-particle states. So once you can approximate single particle states, you can just multi-particle that space to approximate all states. Uh, so the conclusion is that if you look at the states obtained by applying a low energy Hermitian operators near the boundary in this time band zero to epsilon on the vacuum, that already gives you a basis uh, for the low energy Hilbert space. And this, as I said, is a statement that's true in any quantum field theory in any physical space. Okay, so now uh, there's something which is which must be important, and as I said, the, the importance of gravity, uh, and that comes about now. And the importance of gravity is as follows. So first, you know, in this case, we did not give the observers uh, the prior that the state was, was orthogonal to the vacuum. Uh, but that's easy to fix because the observers can directly measure the overlap of the state with the vacuum using the first step, just by measuring the energy and determining how many times they get zero. And if they find this overlap is non-zero, they can make the state orthogonal to the vacuum by acting with a prior state preparation unitary. So it's very easy to make two states orthogonal. All you do is, you know, you take some simple harmonic degree of freedom or some qubit somewhere in the space time and you dephase it or, you know, you rotate it in some way and that will make the state orthogonal to the vacuum. If you open our paper, we have an explicit construction of this operator UZ. Uh, but, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, if you think about it physically, uh, if you just wanted to make a state orthogonal to the vacuum just by making some small excitation in some place, you could easily arrange that. And so the observers do that. Second, once they have redefined the state so that it's orthogonal to the vacuum, the protocol I described a few slides ago directly gives you the mod square of the overlap of this state with any basis element X. Okay? Uh, in particular, let me remind you the way the protocol went was first I act with a unitary e to the i j x or any unitary that just looks like 1 plus i j x near j equal to 0 and then I measure the energy uh, to emphasize this is the part which is special to gravity. I look at the probability that I get zero after I measure the energy. Once again, before I made this manipulation, the, this probability was zero. So I look at how much this probability is after I make this manipulation with this unitary and measure the energy. And then I determine the frequency and that gives you directly mod of g x squared using the calculation I showed a few slides ago. Now this is not enough for the observers to determine the state because the observers need to determine the overlap of g with every basis element, including its phase. Uh, so I'll explain now how to get the phase. In fact, it's not hard. You see, uh, remember that the overall phase of the state G is meaningless. Okay, we never in quantum mechanics we don't care about the overall phase of the state G. So we can fit the overall phase in such a way that there is, we take some reference operator X R, okay, which is some favorite permission operator near near the boundary, and we just pick the phase of G. So we declare that the overlap of G with the state X R, which is X R acting on the vacuum. Uh, is just given by the mod of g and xr. Okay, so this is a purely real quantity. 
uh, as I said, the protocol that we had allows you to determine the mod square of this overlap, but I can always fix the phase of G so that for some operator, at least for one operator, uh, you know, the actual overlap G and X is equal to the mod of the overlap. Okay, that's just a choice of convention and there's uh, no one who can prevent you from doing that. Second, because XR is a Hermitian operator, if I take any other Hermitian operator X, XR plus X is also a Hermitian operator. And using the protocol I described, one can also measure the overlap of G with XR plus X mod squared. But now, because we know mod of GX squared and we know mod of GXR squared, you see this directly gives you real, the real part of G and X, because remember G and XR is real. Now, once you know the real part of G with X and you also know mod of GX squared, this almost completely gives you GX. Uh, it doesn't completely give you GX because it leaves a sign ambiguity in the imaginary part of GX. The sign ambiguity is a little annoying, but it can be fixed. Uh, I won't go into details of how to fix it, although if there are questions, I'm happy to answer them. But basically, the point is you need to find one more reference operator XI, which has the property that its overlap with G is completely imaginary. Uh, such an operator can always be found and it's explained in our paper how to find such an operator and this is just required to fix the sign part the sign we have these protocols that allow us to measure the mod square of the overlap of g with any basis state and then by picking some conventions and these two reference operators you can actually get g and x the overlap of g with any basis state and once you have the overlap of g with all these basis states you can just systematically determine G by just running through all basis states and determining the overlap of G with all of them. Okay. Okay. Uh, so this is a summary of our protocol. This is the flow chart. Uh, as I said, you know, uh, you start by determining if uh, G is orthogonal to the vacuum or not. If it's not orthogonal, you act with the preliminary unitary operator to make it orthogonal. You find these reference operators XR and XI, and then you systematically determine the overlap of G with all the energy eigenstates, which are a basis for the Hilbert space using the protocol I described. And then you can verify in the end, uh, and we have a verification protocol as well, whether the overlap of this estimated state one found uh, was uh, you know, close enough to one with the true state or not. If it is, you stop. If it's not, you go back and repeat these steps with intermediate accuracy. But the physical point, the main physical point, leaving aside all these technicalities, is that all these processes only involve acting with simple unitary operators near the boundary and subsequently measuring the energy. And you just do this for many possible unitary operators in a very systematic way, and it allows you to completely determine the state of the system. Okay, okay. so uh, this is uh, this this uh, completes the protocol. As I said, I'd like you to take back take the main physical point uh, home, or rather the technicalities, which are given in great detail in the paper. But let me just emphasize some of the implications of this protocol. One of the important implications of this protocol has to do with quantum information measures. You see, often uh, in quantum field theory, we say we have the vacuum and we measure the entanglement entropy of one part of a Cauchy slice with another part. But here, notice that if, if you treat the entanglement entropy as a measure of ignorance, as a measure of how much information is not contained in this brown region, then that measure for this setup is zero. And that's because in the ADS vacuum from this region near the boundary, as I just explained to you, you can completely determine what the state in the middle of ADS is. I want to emphasize that in our, some of our earlier papers, including, for instance, this 2016 paper we wrote, we ourselves said that, you know, the entanglement will emerge if you focus on simple operators. So, you know, the entanglement between the brown region and the yellow region is the entanglement between simple and complicated operators. But you see that that naive expectation, which is an expectation I think that many people in the community had, is not true. Because everything I did here was performed within what's called the code subspace, which is the space of simple operators. And already we see that acting with simple operators in this brown region completely determines the state of the full Cauchy slice. And therefore, just restricting to simple operators is insufficient uh, to define a meaningful entropy. I think it's a very interesting question of how one should define uh, the entanglement entropy in theories of gravity uh, for geometry configurations like this. Uh, but what this protocol tells you is that whatever one does, it will have to be uh, something much more, uh, much more clever uh, than just restricting to simple operators. OK, uh, so let me now say a little bit about, about how uh, one can extrapolate these results. I'll try and go fast because I think I have already taken too much time. Uh, so uh, I'm now not going to give details, but I'll just try and describe, describe some extrapolations of these results. So, so far, I described for you a low energy physical protocol that allows these observers near the boundary to obtain information. 
in fact if you do a careful extrapolation of these same arguments you have to be careful it takes you know this argument takes you beyond the regime of validity this leads you to the conclusion of holography of information in the full theory without assuming ads cfd okay? uh, so i'll try and explain how this careful extrapolation is done i won't go into details in fact uh, a few months ago i gave a talk at the max planck institute uh, uh, precisely on this on this subject, which is on YouTube, so I'd refer you to that talk if you'd like details of how this extrapolation is done. Uh, but I'll explain how this extrapolation is done and also how a similar extrapolation uh, leads to an argument for the holography of information in asymptotically flat space. And once again, there's, a, I think, a short uh, uh, talk at Strings 2020, which is on YouTube, uh, where this is described uh, in, in, some, in some detail. Uh, so I'll just describe the results here and won't go into details of this. Okay. Uh, so let me just describe what the result is if you were to extrapolate these arguments I was making for Lola. So the color scheme for my figures has changed. I now have these rainbow colored slices. Uh, the rainbow colored slices means I'm now no longer going to restrict myself to the low energy sector of the theory. And I'm going to consider all possible states in the theory, which could have all possible excitations, maybe black holes. So this could be a black hole or some other excitation in the, in the interior. And the extrapolation of the argument that we've been exploring so far is that if two states this then can be pushed by observables in the time band zero to epsilon in some very narrow time band here above. Uh, what are the assumptions that go into this extrapolation? So you know I gave you an argument for low energies and now you might think I'm making an argument for the full theory. So how do I extend the low energy argument to the full theory? Uh, you see the first important assumption we need to make when we extend the low energy argument to the full theory is that we need to assume that this operator that we were measuring, which was the subleading fall off of the metric, this operator continues in the full theory to identify the vacuum. This is not to assume that this operator remains the Hamiltonian of the full theory. Maybe once you include string theoretic effects and so on, the Hamiltonian is more complicated. But this is the statement that you, know, you cannot hide energy in quantum gravity from the boundary. So if this operator looking at the subleading fall off of the metric tells you that the energy is zero, then you are really in the vacuum, and this is true also in the full theory. This is a reasonable assumption because it's an assumption that the low energy sector of effective field theory coincides with the low energy sector of the full theory. But it is an assumption, nevertheless, because we are not treating the full bulk theory non perturbatively. Okay? If you assume this, and you also assume that the full non perturbative theory can be formulated in the Hilbert space that's given by exciting the vacuum with boundary operators at arbitrary times. But then this leads you to the result. So let me explain the second assumption briefly. The second assumption is a statement that in the full theory of quantum gravity, one can obtain all states, so one can formulate this theory in a Hilbert space, which is obtained by exciting the vacuum with all by throwing things in from the boundary at all possible values of the time. This is a good assumption because this Hilbert space is explicitly closed under time evolution. So, and the reason it's closed under time evolution is if you do time evolution, that just moves one of these excitations from somewhere here to somewhere here. Okay? So just considerations of unitarity cannot force us to include additional states. Second, this Hilbert space is quite large because it accommodates all black holes that can be formed from collapse. If one accepts this assumption, then in fact, by using standard analyticity arguments, one can squeeze the Hilbert space and come back to the same result that we had previously that this Hilbert space of the theory can be generated by acting with Hermitian operators from the time band zero to epsilon on the vacuum. Okay, uh, the the difference between what I said previously is that in the full theory I can no longer restrict the simple Hermitian operators, but I have to allow all possible Hermitian operators from the time band. Uh, but you know we have to do that because we are in the full theory now. Then you can easily extrapolate the arguments that we had previously. Uh, to argue that all information about the bulk is available in an infinitesimal time band in the boundary. And the way the argument goes is quite simple. Take some operator A in the theory, expand it on a basis of complete states. Uh, this basis of states can be written as get xn bra xm, where I'm using the same notation as previously. This is the action of the operator xn, which is an operator from this red region on the vacuum. This is an action of the operator xm on the vacuum. But now this operator that appears in the middle, you know, which is ket of zero bra zero is P zero, which by the assumption I made previously is also an operator that lives in this red time band. And therefore the entire right hand side is something that lives in this time band. Again, I'm going through it fast. 
but is basically just an extrapolation of the physical protocol that I described previously. And the point I want to emphasize is that if you make these careful assumptions about what properties the low energy theory shares with the full theory of quantum gravity, that leads you directly to this result about the holography of information. Okay. There is a similar result for holography of information in flat space. Uh, let me just try and explain uh, what the result is very quickly. The result is that in flat space, if in asymptotically flat space in four dimensions, if you look at the space of massless particles, so all information about massless particles, you might have thought, and in a local quantum field theory, this information lives on all of scry plus. So it lives on this full region. But in a theory of gravity, using the kinds of arguments I described, you can argue that this information, in fact, lives on the past boundary of scry plus, or correspondingly, you can extract the same information from the future boundary of scry minus. This is, again, using the kinds of arguments I described, because here the Cauchy slice you have, you can think of as scry plus, and this is the boundary of the Cauchy slice. This red and orange bands are the boundaries of the Cauchy slice. Okay, there is, of course, a difference with ADS. In some sense, flat space is more intricate. And the difference with ADS is that unlike ADS, one tends to lose the information as one moves along the boundary. In particular, if you look at this, this purple and these magenta cuts, you see that the information that's available on a later cut So all the information is available in this red region. And then if you go up here, less information in the red region is available. But all information to the future is available already here. And all information to the future of this part is already available here. Okay. Uh, so that's the result. Uh, and to derive these results, you once again need assumptions that are very similar to the assumptions I described uh, for the full theory in ADS. You need the assumption that the vacuum of the theory and the full theory are identifiable by charges near scry plus minus. This is an assumption that's manifestly true in low energy effective field theory in four-dimensional flat space. The assumption one needs to make about the full theory is that the low energy sector of the effective field theory shares this property with the low energy sector of the full theory. And uh, to derive this second assumption, uh, the second result about how you know information changes as you go along scry plus, uh, you need slightly stronger assumptions. Uh, you need the assumption that some commutators uh, that you get in the low energy theory are in change with the full theory. Uh, and you could, you know, we could, we could discuss that assumption. But if you accept both these reasonable assumptions, uh, then indeed you find uh, these two results, which is first that information in the full theory of quantum gravity in flat space is holographic, in that all information can be obtained from ex you know, all information can be obtained from the past boundary of scry plus, and second that information that's available on any cut of scry plus is also available on any earlier cut. Okay, so I'm sorry for going through that somewhat fast, but as I said, I described that in in great detail in the previous talk. Uh, so I just wanted to, to, to run through those results to jog your memory uh, to say a few things about black holes. Uh, so maybe I'll take five minutes more and then, then I'll stop. Is that okay, Shantan, if I take like five minutes more? You can take your time. Okay. There is no time bound. Okay, fine. Thank you. I, I, I'll just take like five, five minutes more. Okay. okay. So let me, let me now talk about the implications for black holes and I'll, uh, most, most of this discussion will also be qualitative. Okay. Okay. So the main implication, if you believe these results, uh, as I emphasize the results we had, you know, said that information about some region is already available near the boundary. If you believe this, it tells you that one needs to change the way we ask questions about black holes. In particular, you know, the way we usually think about black hole evaporation is that, you know, here you have a black hole, the black hole was formed in some way uh, by the collapse of some matter, and now you draw a nice slice, and then you tilt the nice slice up, 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 and you collect all the Hawking radiation, and then you ask, how does the information come out of the black hole as it evaporates? Okay. So this is the way we usually or commonly ask questions about black hole information. What these results have been describing suggest is that the information is always outside. If one makes the right measurements and you don't have to go to the green part of the Cauchy slice, you can even look at this red part, which you know looks like it's at the same time as the black hole exists, but one already can obtain complete information about the state from outside without having to visit the interior of the black hole. Okay? So it tells you in a sense that this question of asking how does information emerge from the black hole and Hawking evaporation uh, may not be the right question to ask in gravity. Of course, information does emerge. You can also get the information by looking at the green slice. There's no problem in getting the information that way. 
but in a sense the information is always present outside and can be extracted using physical operations as I described in the first part of this talk. Okay. okay, now this has some implications once again for quantum information measures. You see, it's common in discussions of a, a black holes in asymptotically flat space uh, to define a state on scry plus, and one defines a state on scry plus as follows. One looks at a set of all operators that live between minus infinity to some cut u, and one asks what is the element of this algebra uh, which correctly reproduces the expectation values of all such operators, which is the usual way one defines a density matrix uh, in quantum field theory. And then one can ask about the von Neumann entropy of this kind of a density matrix. But remember, you know, from the arguments I've been giving you, which tell you that in flat space, a copy of all operators, all massless operators is available near the pass boundary. It tells you that this density matrix, whatever it is, can also be chosen to be just some operator that lives near the pass boundary of null infinity. And if that is the case, then you see that if you were to compute the von Neumann entropy of this density matrix, it cannot depend on you because you can always choose the density matrix to be something that lives near the pass boundary of future null infinity. And that would tell you that if you were to compute the von Neumann entropy defined in this way using this kind of a definition of the state, you would find that the von Neumann entropy is just a constant as you go along u, as you start from u equal to minus infinity and go up towards u equal to infinity. Now, this is sometimes uh, attention when I, when I give this talk, but in fact, I want to emphasize that the main part I want to make here is not about this entanglement entropy curve. Because it may be the case that some appropriate restriction of the algebra, you know, if you throw out some operators from the algebra, and I can even try and describe what operators you need to throw out, that you could get the conventional page curve by throwing out some operators from the algebra. But the important physical point I want to emphasize, which is the point here, is that what this von Neumann entropy curve is telling you is that information is always available outside. Information is always available, is already available at the past boundary of future null infinity. So if you're asking questions about information, then this information available doesn't change as you go from the past boundary up on null infinity uh, towards time like infinity. Uh, so the question to emphasize once again is not a question of, you know, what mathematical manipulation can you do to define an entanglement entropy that obeys uh, what we expected, which was the page curve, but rather a physical question about information. And the claim is that if you ask this physical question, then you would find that no additional information emerges as you go up. On scribe plus. Okay, uh, so of course there have been there's been a lot of recent work on uh, deriving uh, the page curve, and so let me just explain how these results I'm, I'm describing are consistent with that. Uh, so all the recent work on deriving the page curve consists, uh, you know, considers black holes uh, which are coupled to a non-gravitational path. When one does that, the Hilbert space factorizes explicitly as the Hilbert space that corresponds to the black hole times the Hilbert space of the bar. And when you have a factorization of the Hilbert space, it's clear, you know, you can think of this whole process as a non-gravitational process. There is some non-gravitational dual to the black hole. Maybe it's n equal to four super young mills. It's coupled to a bath. And you know, of course, you just have a non-gravitational system, both uh, the entropy of the black hole and the entropy of the bath uh, follow a page curve. And these calculations are very nice and they're very interesting uh, that they, you can derive the page curve in this way. It's extremely interesting and very nice. But it's important that this calculation which is done, which is of a black hole coupled to a setup with no gravity, is not the same as the setup of a black hole coupled to a world with gravity, which is the way black holes in a real asymptotically flat space would behave. So often people do the calculation in the setup on the left, which is where you have a black hole and then you just switch off gravity at some point, and then they just draw the diagram on the right and they say, this is how we think, uh, you know, things should behave in asymptotically flat space. And that I think is not justified because in fact, uh, one of the, the results or one of the, the models that comes out of these computations is that when one asks fine grained quantum information questions, weak effects in gravity can conspire to give radically different answers from local theories. And therefore in systems where gravity is non-dynamical beyond some region, which are all the systems in which the page curve has been derived, uh, it is probably the case that information emerges only after the page time. But if one looks at more realistic black holes or black holes in true asymptotically flat space, then I think the physical statement is that the information is always outside. So I think there's no mathematical inconsistency with the recent derivations of the page curve, but I think for black holes in asymptotically flat space, uh, these derivations uh, may give a somewhat misleading picture of the rate at which information emerges. 
And I think the correct answer to the information is always available on certain platforms. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say. Let me just conclude. This is my summary slide. Uh, the main physical point I wanted to make was that gravity localizes information very differently from a local quantum field theory. In gravity, if you take a region which is encompassed by its complement, then an observer outside, like this observer on the right hand side, knows everything about the region, which is very different from a local quantum field theory, but of course the observer does not. And I wanted to emphasize in this talk, the main point I wanted to make is, this is not just some you know, abstract subtlety which one can uh, brush under the rug and forget about and just continue to use intuition from local theories in, in, in physics. Uh, it's important that you know, this leads to a very concrete protocol for this observer to extract information. It's a statement that's, cont that's contentful already at low energies and in a completely controlled example where one looked at low energy excitations about global ADS, I showed how this observer could extract information about the interior uh, using a very physical protocol. Uh, and of course, this uh, protocol tells us and these results tell us uh, that we need to think more carefully about how quantum information is stored uh, not only in perturbative quantum gravity, uh, but also in black holes. And in particular, uh, for black hole information, uh, the claim is that if you look at systems where gravity is dynamical all the way out to infinity, then the information is always outside the black hole, uh, as opposed to other setups where gravity switches off at some point. Okay, so I'll stop here. Thank you for your attention and sorry for going a little over there. Um, thank you, Subrat, for your nice talk. And uh, I would uh, suggest uh, all the participants to ask questions because we have no time bound in that way because you can ask questions. So please ask questions. Uh, there are uh, right now some chats you can. I should see. Should I see the chats? Maybe I stop the share. Hello? Yeah. Huh, uh, so I wanted to ask that whether that. Uh, the region R and R tilde, whether uh, the presence of a horizon uh, poses any difficulty in your uh, analysis. I mean, uh, what you have done is uh, uh, any presence of a uh, horizon, is it any? No. No, uh, it doesn't. Uh, let me emphasize that, you know, uh, the protocol I gave in the first part of the talk was a low energy protocol. Okay? Yeah. Uh, and the low energy protocol, you don't have a horizon. Right, but right. you know, if you believe the extrapolations which I described in the second part of the talk, in the presence of a of a horizon doesn't do anything because you just take a Cauchy slice, and you know the fact that there's a horizon which is a global space-time property doesn't make any difference. In fact, let me emphasize one more point. Maybe if I go back, uh, let me go back to my setup. Uh, you see, if you look at this setup where you have these observers here, you know there is kind of a horizon. You know, if you look at these observers who are confined to making observations in a time band. There is a horizon, it's a horizon which is artificial. But the horizon is because these observers detectors stop functioning after t equal to epsilon, they can't see beyond this depth in the bulk. So it looks like there is a horizon for these observers. They can't see beyond some point. But what I tried to point out was that in gravity, they can by using gravitational effects. So now if you take a black hole, then the claim is that you know you take a Cauchy slice that runs through the black hole, and it looks pretty much the same way. And you know the arguments I gave uh, don't care about whether there's a horizon or not. Uh, you know, they, they, uh, so uh, the arguments are valid in the presence of a horizon. As I said, even in this toy model about global ADS, it looks like you know, there is a horizon, uh, but the observers are able to look past the horizon. Uh, and I, you know, the same thing, in fact, you can do if you looked at excitations about black holes. So if you just look at like, simple field theoretic excitations about black holes, uh, you can use similar protocols to try and get, you know, look past the horizon. Uh, but uh, just to say once again, this protocol I described in the first part, is of course not sufficient to give you the full micro state of the black hole because for that you need the extrapolations that I described. Okay? So this protocol where you're just acting with simple operators and measuring the energy uh, is not sufficient to identify you for you the micro state. Uh, if you want to identify the micro state, you're forced uh, to do more complicated operations, not just simple operations. Uh, but that's as we expected. You know, if you want to identify the micro state by collecting Hawking radiation, you have to collect Hawking radiation and do operations to an accuracy which is you know, e to the minus s. Uh, so uh, the answer in short to your question is the presence of horizon uh, does not affect these effects that I'm describing or whether information about R is, is present in R or not. Uh, the presence of a horizon takes us beyond the regime of validity of the simple physical protocol because it takes us beyond simple low energy physics. But I think by reasonable extrapolations, we can, you know, we can argue that the results we derived at low energies continue to hold in the presence of a horizon. Okay, thank you.
Next question is by Anuga. Uh, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I can ask a question. Uh, I just wanted to ask uh, that uh, your protocol suggests that we can probe all information. To Sorry, I can't hear anything. Sorry, uh, Shantan, I'm not able to hear. I don't know if you can hear. No, I can't able to hear. So uh, maybe uh, next uh, next one, Takato Mori, you please ask. Okay, so I have two questions. And first, uh, maybe I I just miss. Uh, by by the term observer, you mean uh, a non-local observer here in boundary? Oh, you mean you mean not oh, you mean non-local meaning because it's spread out in the sphere? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. So, so, so indeed, you should. I should have said obs so observers. So, so you're right. This is a good point. Uh -huh. You see, the observers we have are observers who are spread out in the sphere. So there are two ways you can do it. First, you can have a team of observers. So one one they have detectors spread out all over the sphere, and then they make observations, and then later they meet and they collect their results together. So that's one possibility. Mm -hmm. Second, you can think, you know, you have a single observer, but because you have identically prepared states, the observer makes a measurement first at this point and next state at this point and third state at this point and so on. You now the observer can, can go about and make, make measurements at different points in different copies of the identically prepared state. Uh, so it is important. Yeah. The second option work because you have to measure the Hamiltonian then uh, from uh, the Gauss law. I, yeah, I, yeah I, I think it works because you know the, the Hamiltonian is a sum of HTT. So the second option is right. that the observer measures like the metric at this point and then they measure metric and just sums up the results. So I think the second option does work. Uh -huh. Well, what, thank, what about the uh, yeah, yeah. dynamic of evolving? What, what if uh, what the background the, is that? Yeah. What, what if the background is evolving dynamically? Uh, so then, the observers need. Yeah, sorry. Please. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Uh, the observers need access to a clock. So, you know, uh, they, do a, they do an operation at some time t in the other state in which they're going to measure the Hamiltonian. They need to go and measure the same, the metric at the same time t. So, you have identically prepared yeah, states right. and indeed the background is evolving. But you, they need to have access to a clock which allows them to synchronize their observations across different states. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. that, that's important. I... Otherwise, the dynamical evolution works. Yeah, it's quite nice. Do you have any idea restrict if we restrict the observer to be uh, only uh, some part of accessible region? I mean, the, like a subregion duality. Uh, yeah, I, I, that's a very interesting question. So you should one should get subregion duality. You know, if one if one didn't take like the full uh, region, but one took like parts of the boundary, then presumably the correct answer is that the observers can probe the entanglement wedge. Uh, I don't know how to prove mm -hmm. that answer, but I would very much like to be able to prove it. Uh, of course, in the case where the entanglement wedge is the causal wedge, it's kind of simple. Uh, but the interesting cases are the cases where the entanglement wedge is not the causal wedge. And I think the correct answer should be that, you know, even in those cases, the observers can use these effects to look at the entanglement wedge. I think it's very interesting and I would like to be able to prove it, but I don't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the second question is, uh, you said uh, there is no entanglement between annulus and the rest of the areas. And uh, so th there's no entanglement entropy. Uh, I, maybe I, if I said there's no, yeah. If you try to measure the von Neumann entropy, uh, please ask the question actually, I can answer. Yeah. If, uh, there, I thought uh, if there is no entanglement entropy, then I, I just wonder how we can extract the information of uh, operator uh, placed on, in the center of bulk from the boundary. Yeah. I just uh, wonder. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So there is entanglement in some sense. But there's no entanglement. Well, you know, the point is that the, the observers who live in this part of the region already have complete information about the interior of ADS. So if you want to define entanglement entropy as a measure of ignorance, you see, in, entanglement entropy is a notion that the observers here perceive the state, this brown part, as being a mixed state. And the question is, how mixed is the state? But you see, if the, if the global state is pure, the observers already know that the state is pure. For instance, to take a specific example, let's just take the global state to be the vacuum of ADS. Then the observers, by yeah. measuring the Hamiltonian, already know they're in the vacuum. So the state is not mixed. Yeah. They've already identified the complete state. So there's no sense in which one can ascribe a meaningful von Neumann entropy to the state because they know the state is pure and they know what the state is. So that's the sense in which I was saying that there, you know, it seems uh, it's not clear how one can ascribe a meaningful von Neumann entropy. 
since the observers in this brown region already know what the state is. Of course, this is so to emphasize if you go back to the other question you asked, where you look at subregions on the boundary, then the state will not be pure. And then presumably the entropy will be the entropy that you get in the boundary QFT. But in this system, where I'm taking the full boundary, uh, you know, the observers know everything about the bulk, and it's not clear how, you know, you know, if for normal entropy is interpreted as a measure of ignorance, as a measure of how mixed the state is. It's not clear how what value one should assign to that. I mean, the most natural value is zero. There may be some other clever way of describing the von Neumann entropy and getting a non-zero answer, uh, but I don't know what that is. I see. I see. Thanks. Next question. Anybody want to ask? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, so, uh, according to uh, your claim, so uh, do you also do you also say that uh, there is nothing like a scrambling time? And for the black holes? Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, I would not say that. I mean, I, I was just, I would just think of a scandal time as a time in which you make an excitation and after time log in, uh, the excitation, you know, dies off to a time one over there. Uh, so I would not say that. Uh, okay. I, I didn't understand what, why you would think that there was a link between the two. Uh, I was thinking that, uh, so I have thrown something into the black hole. And yes. uh, it scrambles inside the black hole, and when it uh, comes out, when the information uh, comes out again, the pit smack thing. So, uh, whether I, whether the outside state also knows about that uh, throwing in uh, uh, and how things scramble inside the hole and all this. Are getting scrambled in that? Let me say once more. You know, to measure these these effects, determine this excitation. In this case, I had to use like quantum gravity effects. Of course, if I just had, if the excitation was living right next to the boundary, I could do it without even measuring, without you know, using any quantum gravity effects. In the same way, in fact, in a black hole, if you throw something inside, it does become harder and harder to observe it using quantum field theory. At some point, the claim is that you know, if you were to use these quantum gravity effects and make accurate observations, you would be able to reconstruct the microstate. But of course, it's easiest when the black hole hasn't formed. If you just have a ball of dust, uh, that's much easier to probe than probing the microstate of a black hole. Uh, so the statement is not that the information is as e you know is easy to obtain outside the black hole. Clearly, the information uh, outside the black hole about the black hole microstate is hard to obtain, requires complicated measurements. Uh, but the point is that is also true if you try and collect the ultimate Hawking radiation. So uh, it's not that the information doesn't get scrambled, but the point, the comparison I want to make is the between the state when the black hole exists and the state when the black hole has completely evaporated. And I want to say there is no clear hierarchy of difficulty between those two states. If you compare that with the state earlier when the matter is really physically outside, it's clear at that point the information is easiest to obtain. And then it gets scrambled. Okay. Okay. And a uh, related question. So when you uh, say that the uh, actual page curve should be just a flat curve, if we uh, think in that way so and you said that if we uh, instead of considering non-gravitational flat space if we consider weak gravity in there uh, so we should get something like we should expect something like a uh, flat page curve so in that case uh, do, uh, when people take the boundary of the uh, in the island formula whatever they write as i union r in the right hand side so when uh, in that r region if we include the boundary of the ads as well uh, so delta ADS, so there is a result that uh, in that case, the entanglement entropy becomes zero. So if the boundary of the ADS is included within the, uh, with the non-gravitational flat space. Yeah, uh, just to emphasize, I mean, you know, I, uh, what I was saying was not in contradiction with the island formula because the island formula is derived in a setup of this kind. So yes, know, yes. Uh, you really have, and, and, and so it's, you know, in this situation, when, when you have this black hole system, which is leaking information to this non-gravitational system, uh, there will be a page curve. There will be a page curve because you should think about the cartoon being as, as drawn here. That there is a black hole system and a bath system. And you, you can evaluate the entropy of the black hole or the entropy of the bath. And this is, you know, literally a non-gravitational setup. You could have like n equal to four super young in a lab and couple it to some other bath. And it would just look like a non-gravitational setup where information goes from one to the other. Uh, so the Hilbert space factorizes. It so happens that in this case, one of the theories has a gravitational dual. And you know you can you can use the Ryu Takinagi formula to compute uh, what S P H and S path, uh, but or you can use the quantum extremal surface not Ryu Takinagi quantum extremal surface formula to compute uh, S P H and S path. Uh, but uh, the the point is that this is different from from the setup of a, this is this does not 
correctly describe a black hole in asymptotic leap time space. I want to emphasize once more one more point I made previously, which is I did say the page curve would be flat, but it's important that you know. I think that you should be able to redefine the algebra on Scribe Plus in such a way so as to get the conventional page curve. So I don't want to focus attention on the page curve so much as this last statement here, which is that from a physical point of view, I think in asymptotic free flat space, information is always available and it doesn't emerge according to the page curve in any natural sense. Uh, the fact that there may be some mathematical redefinition of the algebra in which you discard some operators which will give you the page curve, I think is probably true, although no one has shown it. Uh, but the important physical point I want to explain is this, and this last physical point, which is that the information is always outside, is what is different between the setup where you have gravity that's weak but extends all the way out to infinity, and the setup where gravity just switches off at some point. Okay, so uh, if one, uh, instead of considering non gravitational flat space, do you think if one considers weak gravity, and even if, even in that region, one considers something like uh, gravitational entropy? Uh, added to the conformal matter entropy that one usually calculates in the non-gravitational uh, flat region. One would also, uh, should one also see this kind of uh, behavior that you're seeing? Yeah, yeah, I think so, absolutely. Because, you know, in, in, in these setups, at some point, you know, uh, you know, you, there's a graviton, the graviton stops existing and you have transparent boundary conditions for the matter. Uh, but if, if you allow the graviton to extend all the way out to infinity, uh, these constraints will apply and you will find that information is always outside. I mean, if, if the extrapolation that I'm describing is correct. If there's something wrong with the extrapolation, we this case, uh, but extrapolate, then I think in that setup, you would find the information is always available outside. It does not emerge out of the page. Code. Okay, thanks. I should have... Yeah, I got them, yeah, yeah. Great talk. So, yeah, I, I have two uh, questions. Um, one is, I think, related, somewhat related to the previous uh, question. So suppose you have uh, a situation in which this bath is also holographic, and there's a gravity dual to that. Somehow, uh, your arguments should not, um, uh, cannot be taken to that situation, and you should still get a page curve. In that. Yeah. So suppose right. here you have this yeah. situation. You know, they have. Uh, so remember, they have one situation in which the bath also has a holographic dual. Uh, the question is whether, yeah, yeah whether go the ahead. coupling is gravitational or not. You see, just having if you if you couple them by this is like you know the the point that Andreas Karch and collaborators make, which is that all mm -hmm. these calculations that have been done have been done in a setup where the graviton is massive. Uh, uh, let me say it another way. You know, the question is whether whether the, the, the graviton extends, the same graviton extends from inside the ADS into the bath. If you can think of them as part of one gravitational system. Uh, if you were to think of two setups, which are both holographic, but they are coupled only by the matter stress tensor being transparent from one to the other, uh, mm. that's not a gravitational setup. I mean, we could, we could ask what happens in that, and that's something we are thinking about. But uh, the important thing for, for, for the argument that I, I made to hold is that the gravity, the same graviton that extends inside this ADS black hole should extend also into the bath. If that works, then indeed I think the bath would always have information. Uh, let me say it another way. You know, there should be a rule which tells you that if you add it, it's very simple. Can you measure the mass of the black hole from the bath or not instantaneously? That's, that's the, the defining criteria for whether uh, information is outside or not. In all of these setups where the calculation has been done, you cannot do that. Because, you know, the bath knows about the stress tensor and gradually the matter flows or energy flows into the bath. But if I were to ask you, you know, tell me at this point of time, what is the mass of the black hole? Uh, you can't do that from the bath. There is no, you know, Gauss law that extends all the way to the bath. Uh, and I think if the Gauss law were to extend, then I think uh, these arguments I have to hold. So it's really a very simple criteria. Can you determine the mass of the system from the bath or not? In all of these setups, you cannot. There is a, there is this uh, maybe a weak kind of um, link you would say, which is that the there is a matching condition between the higher dimensional metric and uh, you know the uh, let's say I'm talking about uh, three dimensional metric, um, I mean two D three D situation. So the the three D metric uh, it has a matching condition to the two D situation when it goes to the goes to the boundary. Of the uh, of the three D space, mm, there is a matching condition. So, Usually, isn't it for the for the uh, so uh, let's say we you know 
don't want don't we want to put transparent boundary conditions for the stress tensor uh, but not transparent boundary conditions you know uh, for, for for the metric you know if you um, um, let me try to say so if there is a matching condition between the metric what does it imply for the um I, oh, okay. I, I see. I see what you mean. I see what you mean. So you you're saying one is doing Delish yeah. lane. One is doing Delish lane in both. And I see uh, maybe maybe that. Yeah, that just to say once more. You know, you have a stress. You have a CFT that's propagating in the bulk here, and the yeah. same CFT extends here in the boundary. And now there's no metric. Yes. And and one one sets the stress tensor to be continuous across this interface. But the question I want to ask is, you know, is there a is there an integral I can do in the interface that will the, in the Bath region that will implement the Gauss law? Is there is there some is there some way if I add some mass here, I mm -hmm. cannot do it without changing something in the Bath. And in all these setups, you can, and that's why you have a factorized Hilbert space. You know, the the setups rely on having a factorized Hilbert space, and you know which uh, which which is because you can set set up this black hole and the Bath states independently from the start. There are no constraints that link the two. If there were, I think, I mean, you would not get in any easy way the page curve. You could, I think, but I think you would not get it in some simple way. I see. I have to think about this, but um, I, I see what you mean. Yes, yes. Yeah. In my other uh, the question was um, uh, related to uh, going back to previous. Um, you know, I'm. Uh, Thinking of um, QED or uh, some gauge theory, non gravitational gauge theory, in which, um, you know, le let's say I have, I have a dipole uh, charge distribution which does not have a monopole, uh, you know, overall charge thing, but even a dipole charge distribution will have uh, a weaker, I mean, you know, it, it will have a, a faster fall off at infinity. Like uh, one over R cube and whatnot. Um, yes. So, admittedly, uh, it will not contribute to some, you know, uh, total Gauss law integral. But uh, there should be a way of, uh, you know, measuring. The thing is, will contribute to Q squared. Uh, if you were to measure the expectation value of Q squared, ah, because there's a good. there's a positive and negative that's sitting there, it will probably contribute to Q squared. So. It, so you know, if you compute the expectation value of Q squared, this you, you you might you might see that. But yeah, you know, right. once again, so, to emphasize, there are yeah. Go ahead. In, in gauge series, there are operators which just exactly commute with Q. I mean, these are all the local gauge invariant operators. You take trace of f squared, that just commutes with Q. So I act with a unitary operator which is e to the i trace of f squared. No no moment of Q is going to give it is going to give you anything about that. Uh, is going to give you any information about that. So in a gauge theory, you know, it, it, I, I agree with you that there is some limited sense in which you get information about the charge, but it's, mm -hmm. it's very limited and that's because you have these exactly local gauge invariant operators. So in fact, in gauge theories, there is a notion of what's called a split state. I mean, I, did, I didn't say that it's slightly formal, which is that indeed, you know, if you, if you give me a region and you give me a color region, so if you take, take the space time and divide into three parts, maybe I can go to this, or maybe I, let me say it in the context of this. Let's say you take this yellow region and this brown region. Except yeah. for the total charge, uh, you can in fact prepare the states completely independently here and here. So you can hide information. You know, if you allow me to prepare the state correctly, I can arrange a state so it looks like whatever I want inside here, and you know it looks like whatever I want inside here. So I can completely fool the observers outside uh, by basically acting with you know the right kinds of local gauge invariant operators, by acting with e to the i trace of f squared and other gauge other Wilson loop operators here. I can completely fool the observers here by making sure that every measurement they make uh, tells them that you know they're in the vacuum or they're in some other state, and every measurement the observers here make is corresponds to a different state. The only thing I can't hide is the total charge. In fact, if you allow me a small collar region, like you allow me a small region between these two, I can in fact stuff the charge there, and then mm. I can prepare the inside and the outside to be completely independent. But mm. if you don't allow me a collar region, then the total charge escapes. But other than that, you know I can. Basically, prepare the state inside and outside to be completely independent by using these Wilson loop operators, localized Wilson loop operators. There is no analog of a localized Wilson loop operator in gravity because to make something gauge invariant, you have to make it extend all the way out to infinity. So that's the critical difference. I see. Got it. 
Thank you. Next question, please. Any other question? Uh, maybe I, I can ask uh, uh, your student if he wants to speak something. Chandramoli is there, I think. Chandramoli is there? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I don't have anything to ask right now. No, no, I'm saying that if you want to say something about this work. Uh, I, I don't think I have anything more to say. <laughs> okay. So, okay. So anybody have any question? If not, then I will end then. Okay, thank, thank you very much. So, uh, uh, please unmute yourself, everyone, and give a clap for him for giving such a nice talk. And, uh, this talk will be posted in YouTube and I will share the link with you. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, okay. So. I'm stopped.